Hey folks, Hal Shirtliff here with Camp Constitution, and you are looking at the Waterworks Museum in Boston in the um, Brighton section, and it's right on the outskirts of town on Beacon Street, right by uh, Chestnut Hill, and right behind me is a Chestnut Hill Reservoir, and this of course was the water pumping station that serviced uh, Boston and the South Shore where millions of gallons every day went through it. So we're going to go in and get a nice little tour and to learn more about the museum I'd recommend the website. The hours of operation sort of fluctuate throughout the year. Usually open from uh, Wednesday to Sunday. It's free admission uh, but they do accept donations. So I would visit them on their websites. Uh, Metropolitan Waterworks Museum.org I think is the website. Hey folks, this is Hal Sherliff with Camp Constitution and we are at the Metropolitan Waterworks Museum in Brighton, Massachusetts, right on um, Beacon, Street, Beacon Street, right uh, just on the Newton line and uh, just a short distance from Cleveland Circle. Right. And we're here with uh, Julius Gordon and he's the interpreter, interpreter. and he's going to kind of explain this. Docent, that's a more fancy word. Right. A docent, that means you get big money, right? That, no, that means that And he's going to explain all this uh, intricate machinery and what this all means here and how the water gets to our house. So, okay. you got the floor. What I'd like to do is start with a map that gives you the how things are today, okay? Okay. And uh, right now we have Boston over here, okay? Quabbin, which is about 60 miles out over here. And today, Quabbin, which is high enough presently to run water all the way down to the uh, to the coast. Mm -hmm. All right, and just by gravity, but by gravity, gravity, yes. Yeah. No pipes are under pump pressure. Mm -hmm. All the uh, pipes are always under gravity pressure. All right. Now, the area we're interested in when this operation occurred, which is in the uh, mid uh, uh, 19th century, and um, I actually got into in, in the dumps through almost more than half of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, that would be going from Wachusett Reservoir to here at the Chestnut Hill. Okay, these brown lines represent aqueducts, which are tunnels as against pipes. Mm -hmm. Okay, the huge tunnels. The pictures are there. And so what we're going to do is, for the purposes of it, we're going to take this stuff and ignore that, right? But what you said here, and the Quabbin goes back to the 1930s. That's 30s, yeah. right. When these four towns were were, were taken down and... Uh, flooded out. And flooded out, okay. Where you got the... Uh, wah, wah, I forgot the name of the uh, uh, dam. The dam is the... I'll think of the... Still the, the, the Swift River. I think it was. Yeah, but I forget the name of the dam. We used to go up there and do it all the time. Anyway, so we're going we're gonna to be talking today from here to here. These tunnels are part of the Quabbin system, and so therefore this is where the Chestnut Hill uh, is today. And the pumps were, the purpose of the pumps were to get water over these high points, okay, into down into the coast. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so let's go over to that, cut, cut, <laughs> the yellow is the, is the museum, okay, is the building. This round section, if you take a look at down there, you can see that rounded building over there mm -hmm. in the corner. That's the screen room. Uh, they had screened water was brought in from the reservoirs into the screen room where the water was screened. Take out pebbles, rocks, or whatever okay. it is. Okay. The light blue constitutes water going in from reservoirs. In fact, there's the pipe that goes across the street mm -hmm. to the uh, Chestnut Hill. It goes to the screen room, and then the water is, is stored underground in, in cisterns, underground to the floor, I should say. Okay? And then the pumps pumping the water, and that's the dark room. And that water is being delivered to Brookline, Jamaica Plain, Quincy, Water, Belmont, Watertown, Belmont, Washbury, and Quincy, uh, and uh, 
Fisher Hill, which I think is closed now. And, uh, uh, and so this is basically what, how this thing operates. Mm -hmm. This is, this is the, how it's distributed. All right? So now we're going to go see a film and uh, that okay. will uh, give us a summary of what's going on. I, it's, right. it's in, across the... Uh, okay, we're in the pump room here. Building, in the other end of that building is the... It would have been the... Um, uh, would have been the boiler room, okay? And on the far side, that is where the coal was stored. Mm -hmm. Coal was brought in by train, and we have brought them dump into the coal room. And of course, fed to the boiler room. That was the setup. Right now, the boiler, the boiler room and the coal room are condominiums. Oh, that's interesting, yes, yeah. <laughs> they are condominiums. So let's all go. That's quite a, uh, what a, what a device this, what a machine this is, okay. huh? And all it did was pump millions of gallons of water right. for 24 hours a day. And after we're through, I'm going to give you a rundown on how steam engine works. Okay. What do you do, what do, you do for a living? Well, I'm a director at Camp Constitution. You mean as in? Just to give you some sort of perspective on the magnitude of these uh, steam engines, here is uh, the one called the Alice may have become Alice Charmers, but this was uh, late 1800s and these wheels are absolutely phenomenal. They're probably 30 feet, I'm guessing. Solid steel, um, solid iron. And just moving them would be an incredible feat. The Worthington engine. The Worthington is a compound engine, meaning that it has two cylinders because steam loses pressure but gains volume as it works. The second cylinder is larger than the first. Look at the two black box-like steam chests containing the cylinders in front of you and notice that the left cylinder head is smaller than the right. You can see that. Yeah. The Worthington engine is fitted with Cooley's valves, which provided the best thermal efficiency of any type of stationary steam engine of their time. Four oscillating valves incorporated into the steam chest and linked to a central wrist plate are characteristic features of cordless engines. These engines achieved their high efficiency through the precise cut-off of steam supply and exhaust provided by this valve arrangement. I am Desmond Fitzgerald, the first supervising engineer here at the High Service Pumping Station at Chestnut Hill. This marvelous facility. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, you must forgive me for sounding like a proud father, for that would not be far from the truth. It is now 1908, and for 20 years now, I have watched this station grow into the most advanced water facility in the nation. The reservoir and pumping station here at Chestnut Hill are now the hub of a water system that produces over a hundred million gallons a day. And it now includes the largest reservoir in the world, the Wachusett Reservoir, which was brought into operation just this year. You know, my friends, it was not so very long ago that having fresh water piped into one's home was an impossible luxury. That's right. It was the privilege of only the very wealthy. I remember when I was first married, <laughs> a delicate young bride. Yet I had to walk several times a day to the well pump, four blocks from the house, carrying five gallons of water on my back. Can you imagine? And was there no one to help you? Your husband? My husband. That lazy lump never lifted a finger to help me. <laughs> Shameful indeed, madam. I'm sure you ladies here in attendance are more aware than anyone of the benefits of progress. These pumps and pipes do more than any man can do to make your lives easy. Yes, and because of all these pipes and pumps, now I have to take a bath every week. 
I wouldn't call that progress. Oh, my dear boy, uh, you may not yet appreciate the importance of plentiful clean water, but your parents do. And when they were children your age, they were in severe danger of the cholera and typhoid fever. Terrible diseases that were carried by an impure water. During those terrible outbreaks, there were many thousands of little boys and girls who died. And that is why this station has been equipped with an advanced water testing facility. Why, well, here's Mr. Whipple, our biologist. How goes your work, Mr. Whipple? Very well, Mr. Fitzgerald. I've just now come in from taking samples in the reservoir. Last week I noticed slightly higher levels of bacteria. Not harmful in small amounts, really, but I want to keep an eye on it. Better safe than sorry. Very good, Mr. Now, explain to our guests, if you please, how is their city unique in its approach to clean water? <clears throat> well, most cities in our country are willing to take any water they can find, treating it with various chemical agents in order to render it drinkable, or so they imagine. But here in Boston, the planners of our system have considered it of great importance to find water in its pure and natural state, many miles away in the countryside, if necessary. Uh, Mr. Alston, is it not? In your pharmacy business, Mr. Olson, you must know the value of clean, pure water. Have you not noticed, sir, the, the general improvement in the public health over the years? Yes, indeed. Might even say the improved quality of water has been bad for business. <laughs> to bring this bounty to our taps has required the utmost ingenuity. First, an underground aqueduct from the lake in Cochichuan that brought 10 million gallons a day. It was thought to be sufficient for a half century, yet within just 20 years, the demand for water in Boston was dangerously close to the limits of supply. As a matter of fact, the population of our city had increased tenfold by that time to a quarter of a million. And since that time, it has more than doubled again to well over half a million. So it has. Such urban growth in our industrial era is unparalleled in the history of the world and a monumental challenge to the greatest minds in engineering. Here in Boston, the bold solution was the addition of seven new reservoirs from the Sudbury River Basin and the diversion of the main branch of the river by aqueduct directly to here, Chestnut Hill. And then, ladies and gentlemen, a problem. Allow me to introduce my chief engineer, Mr. Doan, who will explain. Yes, well, it is a problem for our old friend Sir Isaac Newton, I should say. The water here at the Chestnut Hill Reservoir is unusable in its current location. It must first be brought to a point of higher elevation, where gravity can have its effect and cause the water to flow through the pipes and into your houses. And how to move all this water? Well, that is where this station comes in. You know, I once worked as an engineer for the railroads, but those engines cannot compare with the magnificent machines we have at work here. Just cast your eye on the marvel behind you. My pride and joy, the Alice engine number four. Ah, uh, she's a big one, Mr. Fitzgerald. Three stories high and two stories below ground where I am now. Well over a million gallons of water are thrust through these pipes every hour with 185 pounds per square inch of pressure. That's nearly as much as the three other engines in this station combined. During her trial run, she broke the world record for efficiency in operation. I tell you, my friends, this remarkable machine could move mountains, if only mountains were made of water. From the time it was erected here some ten years ago, it has run almost without ceasing both day and night. Impossible to say. Not at all, Mr. Dolan. The unique vertical design of this engine, combined with its massive size, results in a powerful but slow stroke of piston and plunger. The pumping action is smooth and not stressful, so there's little wear on the parts. Simply marvelous. Hi, Mr. Fitzgerald. I just love to listen to her hum. She's smooth as silk and quiet, not like these obnoxious combustion engines that they use on these new horseless carriages that we've been seeing on our streets these days. 
the automobiles, as they call them. Well, we live in an age of progress. My friends, as Boston's foremost citizens, you can all feel proud of the bold vision that has characterized your city's efforts. Just as Rome with its marvelous aqueducts once showed the world the way to progress, Boston with its advanced water system is now a beacon of light for this nation. Truly, the Athens of America.